All right, well, anything else that we wanted to cover here today? We have some time. I don't know if anyone has some questions or you get some time back for yourself. Are you all, you know, from, build, from a builder standpoint, um, I don't know if you get involved in bringing this up, but I think like we've talked about and probably beaten the horse to death here is um, the wiring and the shade pockets and channels for blackout shades all of those things provide a lot of value to the homeowner and um, bringing it up as a builder if it hasn't been discussed, I think sh helps you build credibility with the client and opens them up to some new things. Greg, do you have a question? Yeah, so is the default mode the hardwired? Uh, typically, it's a mixture of both. Um, a lot of systems are wired, I mean, the really the industry has kind of chosen three or four main paths. You hear about Zigbee, you hear about Wi-Fi, you hear about radio frequency, and then the hardwired. Um, what we've found is that radio frequency and hybrid systems are the most reliable. Um, so a lot of times what we're doing is we're using what we would call a hybrid. So it's a mixture of like a, essentially like a smart circuit breaker, right? And then low voltage keypads placed around, and then we also combine that with radio frequency dimmers and switches. So like when we deploy a lighting control system, the, one of the, you know, the big factors is yes, where are the devices gonna live, right? And where's that head end component gonna live? But it's also about ease of use, right? And so if you walk into a powder room or something like that, everybody's used to a dimmer dimmer switch, right? You have a light over the vanity, you have a recessed light, you have a fan. And so, you know, having three control devices on the wall is not confusing in that instance, and most people are used to that, right? So it's all about kind of using keypads in areas where, you know, you have over like four loads or something like that to kind of cut down on the, and make it, you know, more easily usable. Um, but it's really about deploying the system in a way where um, you can walk through the space and it feels natural and comfortable. On this best system, um, it is wireless, correct? It's a hybrid system, so it consists the, of a panel, and then right. um, yeah. the you know dimmers and switches are radio frequency based. But the control, like the signal that's sent to the light fixture to give each fixture individual control. With this, yeah, it is networked, yeah. so it's radio frequency. And so that's it's an important point because um, you know in in, a tr in the previous way or more rigid way to do lighting design you end up with having to say, these light fixtures, these three are gonna be controlled by this dimmer, and these four are gonna be controlled by this dimmer. This, design, this gives you unlimited uh, flexibility to combine different lights, raise and lower the color, or the, the dimness, the brightness, and adjust the color of each individual fixture, so you have a, a much greater Des uh, lighting design once the fixtures are installed and how, how you get edited as well. Right. I mean, the general trend in the industry is flexibility, right? I mean, the recessed lights are mudded into the ceiling, right? And they're not easily changeable. So having a fixture that gives you more flexibility a lot of times is going to make the cost jump up, but it's going to have to make the client or the homeowner make less choices in the beginning. Right, and so that's where that kind of value proposition is. Um, you know, if they don't want to answer whether or not it's 2,700 or 3,000 Kelvin and they can't decide, well, it's maybe a good idea to suggest a fixture that can do both. On a hybrid system, you know, what happens when the power goes out? That's the stupid question. But the, uh, when the network's down in the hybrid system, you're still functional? Yeah, so the way the, um, this particular system works is it's not, uh, when we say networked, it creates its own network. So it's not using your Wi-Fi, right? It's creating its own radio frequency network. Um, and uh, if that was to go down, there's still the, the hardwired connection with the low voltage keypads, and then the um, dimmers and switches are literally hardwired like a traditional dimmer and switch, so they still function. What's the, yeah, sure. Share the, uh, if you don't mind, the, uh, the brand of the, of the uh, recess light that you're using there? Yeah, so that's a company called Ketra, K-E-T-R-A. Yeah. So I know um, 
couple years ago, the availability of bulbs for the decorative fixtures was not fully available so that you couldn't have the exact same bulb and controllability with your decorative fixtures. Is that uh, evolving? Uh, slowly, but surely. Um, they do have retrofit bulbs, so if you have a client that's doing a retrofit situation and you want to screw in some PAR lamps, you can do that. Um, they come in a much lower price point. It's about $200 per bulb. Um, but in terms of like MR16 and really small, you know, GU10 bulbs and things like that that you see in a lot of decorative fixtures, they're just the, the form factor is so small that the technology isn't there. Um, and that's something that I do talk about with people. You gotta be really open about that because if you have this giant chandelier in the middle of your dining room and all of your lights are a certain color temperature and that chandelier is a different one, it's gonna be really obvious um, and apparent in the space. So, you know, you have to make that clear up front um, or you suggest a fixture with like a drum shade or something like that or shades that actually hide the light source um, so you can use retrofit bulbs. And um, when, are there any other uh, gotcha? So a builder, you know, if a builder gets involved on the architectural side, um, they're gonna be dealing with, you know, in, connected to the architectural fixtures and the control system. If the designer comes in with decorative fixtures, what are the things to look out for from a control standpoint? So the color is one, right? You might have a bulb that doesn't match what your tunable bulb can do. Any other control gotchas to be aware of so that at the end result doesn't have flickers or something confusing from a control standpoint? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times that, that just goes back to wiring, right? So the decorative selection process usually comes a lot farther along than the architectural selection process. Um, so a big part of it is just making sure you know where decorative fixtures might go. Um, and just like LED recess lights, even if a decorative fixture is an incandescent light source, um, there, there might be different dimming protocols and requirements that are needed. So, you know, a good idea is maybe just run zero to 10 wire to a decorative location. And then if you only use two wires, you only use two wires, right? So there's kind of little tricks like that where you can kind of prepare. Okay. But it's wise to connect whomever is putting in the control system at the decorative phase to avoid any issues. 100%, yeah, Who's ever, whoever is doing that control system needs a full fixture spec package to be able to do what they need to do. All right, any other questions? Sure, thanks, Greg. Brings up a really good question, question sorry. <laughs> really good uh, question when you're working with interior designers and their lighting package, and then you're working with the owner on this circadian rhythm package for the architectural. How do you resolve the two and what, what do you tell the interior designer to, not, to absolutely not do? Um, I don't think, as long as everybody's aware of what that end result is gonna look like, you know, it's pretty wide open. It, the, the problem is when you get that surprise at the end where it's like, oh, this doesn't do that, like that's, you know, that's, that's an important thing to avoid. But, uh, you know, interior designers are gonna pick what they wanna pick, right? And, you know, you just have to be upfront and say that, you know, listen, you know, this is really cool looking and it's gonna look great in the space, but it's not gonna do this. So I just want you to know that, right? Because... Can the architectural light be, I guess, uh, emphasize enough of the change of color throughout the day where the arc, the decorative fixture, it doesn't really impact that. You still get the circadian rhythm and that change of color. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, your, your dining room chandelier isn't on during the day, right? Most of the time it's on when you're having a dinner party. And okay. in that case, you can, if you have tunable lighting, you can certainly match the color temperature of that fixture. Got it, okay. Yeah. This, this is really awesome. Um, this, this has me jazzed up about light. The, your presentation was phenomenal, really. Um, Thank you. I think it really highlights what you're trying to get across. My question is, as technology advances, things get, well, things get smaller and smaller, right? And, and more and more powerful. It, it seems a little bit 
counterintuitive to me that it, this hasn't evolved to the point where it can all be controlled via this with a retrofit type of fixture. Do you have any visibility to, to when that's going to happen? There's still a, a pretty massive uh, barrier to entry to this kind of technology, and that can't possibly continue forever, right? Yeah, I mean, most people don't, realistically, most people don't walk around their house and control it from their phone. Uh, most people like wall controls and things like that, um, especially for like guests and, and things like that. But I mean, with retrofit systems, you can certainly tie in, for the most part, any home into a control system and operate that through your phone. Yeah, this is that's a great question. I, I've been doing this for 20 years, and early on, lighting control and the keypads and the switches, I've seen it where it was overkill and underkill. And we always, you always want to make sure you know who the users are in the house. And what you and, and the range of users are the one-time users, the daily users, and the power users. The one-time user is the babysitter your mother-in-law parents who come over and visit, maybe a cleaner. Daily users are the family members, and the power user is the person who wants to maybe tweak scenes and do things like that. You got to think about the one-time user, that person in a pinch, babysitter, hears a noise, they want to get a light on. They're not fumbling for an app they're not familiar with. They want to go to the wall. They want to push a button. They want to get a light on. Same thing for climate. You can hide thermostats and only have it on the app, and someone's going to say, I'm not comfortable, I don't have the app, what do I do? So I think there's a, there's a control methodology that I know these guys do and, and we preach to integrate it across the life. On the retrofit part, there are bulbs. Philips Hue is one, right? Um, you know, it's lower price, it's more broad market. You can control it from the app. You can also put wireless switches in. Um, the quality of light is not quite there. So, um, and some of the capabilities are not quite there, but it is coming, it's there today. Um, retrofitting without control, um, a lot of the technology to control it is in the bulb itself. And if you turn the power off to that circuit, now that bulb, you can't control it, right? So you have to be able to either keep constant power to the bulb so that you can, so it's always listening for a command or you need to get a lighting control switch with the bulb working together in some way so you don't kill power to the thing that's actually controlling, turning the bulb on, off, and dimming it, things like that. Yeah, so. and I think that also gets to kind of how, uh, how they actually are controlled. Like, there's a lot of retrofit situ situations where you can have, like, even for, like, you know, an old uh, six-inch can, right, you can have a trim kit where you just essentially screw the power source in like a socket and then you now have an LED trim and fixture at the bottom that has tunable light and has RGB, it has all of these things. But a lot of uh, products like that are utilizing methods of control like Wi-Fi and uh, Zigbee and things like that, which we found just aren't as reliable as a radio frequency or hardwired system. There was an interesting product that hit the market 10 years ago, and it was a light source and a speaker that threaded into a recessed can. And everyone thought it was pretty cool. It was a pretty functional product. It didn't take off because of that power issue. You turn that switch off, you can't control it. So it's sort of like a two-step thing. And it was clumsy enough that it really didn't, really didn't take off the way I think some thought. So any other questions? All right, first of all, thank you, System 7. Ashley, Kate, you still out there? Give a wave, can you? We gotta get you on that camera. All right, thanks guys, appreciate it. Andrew, thank you, appreciate everybody.